Lemony Snicket, The Unauthorized Autobiography. This book is very, very funny. Here's a quote from it. Today was a very cold and bitter day, as cold and bitter as a cup of hot chocolate. If the cup of hot chocolate had vinegar added to it and were placed in a refrigerator for several hours, of course this book is probably best understood if you read the series A Series of Unfortunate Events. 8 out of 10. A Series of Unfortunate Events, The Bad Beginning, by Lemony Snicket. The back of the book says if you're looking for something pleasant, maybe this isn't the book for you. 8 out of 10. Having read the first Lemony Snicket book, I had to read the rest of them. The Mysterious Benedict Society and the Prisoner's Dilemma by Trenton Lee Stewart. This is the third in a series of three, so far. I really liked the title, but in execution it wasn't actually as interesting as I hoped it would be. Six out of ten. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas by John Boyne. In order to give a sense of universality to the themes in this book, no specific times and places are mentioned, though Bruno, the main character, does meet somebody who he calls the Fury, and they move to a place that he consistently mispronounces as out with. Bruno is very lonely. Then he meets a boy who lives just on the other side of a fence and who always seems to wear striped pajamas. But since it is about the Holocaust, you know it isn't going to end well. 9 out of 10. The Beginning and Foreign Exchange. Two novels based on the television show Glee. They both have the same quirky humor that the show has, but are probably only for diehard fans of the show who just can't get enough of it. 7 out of 10. The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens. Dickens always makes such good characters. Poor sweet little Nell. Evil Daniel Quilp. This was the only Dickens novel that I hadn't read yet. I finally got around to it. 8 out of 10. The Grove of Eagles by Winston Graham. I really liked this author's Poldark novels, but this novel, set in Elizabethan England, I just couldn't get into. Sorry. 5 out of 10. The Violin of Auschwitz by Maria Angel Anglada. This book happens during World War II when a man must craft a violin to literally save his life. Powerful. 8 out of 10. The Violence of March by Sarah Geo. A woman recovering from a painful breakup goes to visit her aunt and there discovers a diary from 1943, a diary whose contents have resonance and meaning for her today. 9 out of 10. The Orchid Affair by Lauren Willick. It happens half in the modern day, half in the Regency era. I love Regency era stuff, though this is a little more explicit than the kind of things I normally like to read. 6 out of 10. Shoes to Die For by Laura Levine. It's a chiclet slash mystery novel. I got it from the library because on the front it said a Jane Austen mystery. Jane, J-A-I-N-E. But it's nothing special. 5 out of 10. Something New by P.T. Woodhouse. It's about two people in an English country house trying to steal back an Egyptian scarab that was accidentally stolen by somebody else. It's as it says on the front cover. Wild, witty, and wonderful. 10 out of 10. Death at Wentwater Court by Carola Dunn. A mystery set in 1920s England, somewhat akin to an Agatha Christie. The Honorable Daisy Dalrymple is writing an article at a country house when she becomes embroiled in a murder. The chief inspector called in from Scotland Yard just might prove to be a love interest. 9 out of 10. So I got some more in this series to read. Or listen to. These are CD books. It makes doing the dishes so much more interesting. The Daisy Dalrymple Mysteries by Carol Dunn were by an English author who now lives in the States about a woman detective in 1920s England who lost loved ones in World War I. And so is this one by Jacqueline Winspear, A Lesson in Secret. But I didn't like it quite as much. Maisie Dobbs just wasn't quite as charismatic as Daisy Dalrymple. Still, I'll probably read more in the series. 8 out of 10. The detective in these two novels by John Le Croix is Auguste Lupin. He's brilliantly deductive, very sedentary, loves plants and the color yellow. He's the son of Sherlock Holmes and the character who becomes Nero Wolf in the novels by Rex Stout. Get it? Lupin? Wolf? What a brilliant idea. 6 out of 10. Mrs. Jeffreys in the Nick of Time by Emily Brightwell. This is part of a series that happens in Victorian England. Inspector Witherspoon, who works for Scotland Yard, gets some surreptitious help on his cases from his housekeeper, Mrs. Jeffreys, and the rest of his servant. 9 out of 10. Another Mrs. Jeffreys mystery. Mrs. Jeffreys forges ahead. I just love these mysteries. They're so sweet and cozy. Well, as sweet and cozy as a murder mystery can be. 9 out of 10. The Mistaken Wife by Rose Mulliken. This is the third in a series, the first two being The Blackstone Key and The Counterfeit Guest, starring the spirited Mary Finch and her sometimes stubborn suitor, Captain Holland. They're kind of like if Jane Austen wrote a mystery. 10 out of 10. How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe by Charles Yu. This book is so innovative and inventive. Shades of Star Wars and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 8 out of 10. Snow Globe 7 by Mike Tucker. It's a Doctor Who novel. I was browsing through the books at my local Goodwill store and was thrilled to find this. They're never actually as good as the TV show, but I like to read them anyway. 7 out of 10. 
the 2010 Griffin Poetry Prize Anthology. There were a lot of striking images in the poems in this book, but nothing to make me want to read them again. 4 out of 10. Another contemporary poetry book. This one, Canadian poetry in English. But still, nothing that I want to read again. 5 out of 10. The complete works of the poet Byron. In an old edition that is simply beautiful, I just love picking up this book. But look at how small the writing is. This one took me a while. 8 out of 10. Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats by T.S. Eliot. These poems are just so much fun, and they were the basis for the musical Cats by Andrew Lloyd Webber. 10 out of 10. The Rum Tum Tugger is a Curious Cat. The Book of Awesome by Neil Pazwisha. This book reminds you to take pleasure in simple things, like popping bubble wrap or the smell after it rains. There's even a sequel called The Book of Even More Awesome, which I actually read first. I don't know why. 8 out of 10. Geary's Guide to the World's Great Aphorist. This book has lots of good aphorisms, or sayings. One funny one is, if you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit down for a month. 9 out of 10. What's a Disorganized Person to Do by Stacy Platt. I actually don't know really why I got this book, because some people think I'm too organized already, but it did teach me that I should throw up my mascara after three months. 7 out of 10. The Peanut Allergy Epidemic. What's Causing It and How to Stop It by Heather Fraser. Her postulation? That the epidemic started after mandatory childhood vaccinations. That too many vaccinations given too early, containing refined peanut oil, have sensitized children and caused the allergies. Plausible? Impossible? 7 out of 10. For some reason that I can't remember now, I decided I wanted to know more about Fabergé eggs. So I got this book from the library. A book so big, it doesn't even fit in the shot. But, for all its size, it's low on information. 6 out of 10. The Perfect House by Witold Rybczynski. There's about a 100% chance that I pronounced either one or both of those names incorrectly. In this book, the author goes to Italy to tour all of the houses remaining built by the architect Andrea Palladio. It's part travelogue, part biography, part architecture book. 7 out of 10. The Librettist of Venice by Rodney Bolt. This is the story of the man who was born Emanuele Conegliano, but who changed his name to Lorenzo de Ponte, who knew Casanova, started an opera house in America, and wrote the lyrics for some of Mozart's most famous operas. 7 out of 10. Physics of the Impossible by Michio Kaku. This is a science book that talks about whether such things as phasers, force fields, teleportation, and time travel are really scientifically possible. And it has a TARDIS on the cover. 9 out of 10. The Lost Art of Reading. Why Books Matter in a Distracted Time by David L. Ulin. This book itself, 6 out of 10. But reading itself, 10 out of 10.